Hey everyone, in this video we're going to learn how to evaluate functions. As a reminder, the definition of a function is a relation where every input maps to only one output. So using that definition, we can answer the first question, does the graph represent a function? When we're given a graph, the way that we can check that definition is with the vertical line test. And we're looking to see if the vertical lines that we draw intersect the graph at more than one point. So I'll use my vertical line. So we'll check there, right? There's only one point of intersection. And there, there's only one point of intersection. There, there's only one point of intersection. There, there's only one point of intersection. So at home, you don't have the ability to slide the vertical line like I do. So every point where I stopped, you would draw a vertical line. And figure you wanna draw four, five, enough vertical lines where you can confidently say that the graph that you've been given is a function or is not a function. So what I mean by that is if there's a point where it looks like there might be two points of intersection on the graph, draw your vertical line there to check. Right, and as we make our way to the end of the graph, we only had one point of intersection on each vertical line. So does the graph represent a function? Yes. Right, and just to write this out again, every input maps to only one output. Or because it, we had a graph, you could have write, it passes the vertical line test. That works as well. What is the y value when x equals two? So when x equals two, the point on the graph is the point two, one. So the y value is one. Next, what is the equation of the graph? Well, we have a nice y-intercept. It's the point zero, negative three. We have a good slope up two boxes to the right one. So our slope is two. So we can write the equation of this line in slope intercept form. And that's going to be y equals two x minus three. Although you cannot see it on the graph, what is the y value when x equals 15? Now the way we're going to figure that out is use the equation that we just wrote. And we're going to substitute in 15 for x. And we can evaluate y equals 30 minus three. So y equals 27. Right, so to evaluate the y value when x equals 15, we plugged it into our equation. That concept is what we're going to base evaluating functions off of. So we can also write the function from the last slide using function notation as f of x equals 2x minus 3. So important to pause right here and take in this new notation. This is function notation. And now that we've learned function notation, we've seen it right here, most of what we're going to be given is going to be in function notation. Now it's important to understand y and f of x are like synonyms in an English class. They're used interchangeably. We might say y equals 2x minus 3. We might say f of x equals 2x minus 3. They represent the same graph. They represent the same function. And we evaluate them very similarly. So just in general, a function works like a machine. We've used this analogy before. X is the input. It's what's going into the machine. F of X is the output. Or our Y value, right? A function has a graph, it's a set of points. A point is x comma y. So if x is the input, the output's y. And we're just using different notation to represent that output. That notation is f of x. And you'll notice in parentheses, pronounce f of x. This is not f times x, f of x. And what you're thinking of, or what you wanna be thinking of, it's the output, for the input 
of x. Okay, f of x is the output for the input of x. So another way to ask the last question from the previous slide is evaluate f of 15. So we have f of x equals 2x minus 3. So now we're going to have f of 15 equals. So what does this mean? When they give us f of 15, what they're telling you is if x equals 15, what's the output? Right? What's your y? Or what's your f of x when x equals 15? So we're going to do this the same way that we answered the question on the last slide. So we're going to substitute in 15 for x. So I tried to line it up with the colors here. So 15 was our input. That told us our x value. We're going to replace all the x's in our function with 15. So then f of 15, we'll just keep it all blue now, is 2 times 15, which is 30, minus 3. So f of 15 equals 27. So to wrap our head around it, in this notation, f of 15 equals 27, it's telling us if we input 15 into the function, into the machine, the machine's going to output 27. The function's going to output 27. Okay, that's function notation. And this is how we evaluate function notation. Whatever the input they tell us using function notation is what we substitute in for x in the function. Let's look at more examples. Using f of x equals 2x minus 3, so we have the same function, evaluate the following. So f of 0, so that's going to be equal to... Now instead of x, they're telling us, right, f of 0, they're telling you x equals 0. So we're going to substitute 0 in for each x in the function. So times 0, minus 3. So f of 0 equals 0 minus 3. So f of 0 equals negative 3. Now we'll do it for a different input, f of 1. They're telling us that x equals 1. So f of 1 is equal to, the function is 2x minus 3, so 2 times we're going to substitute 1 for x, minus 3. So f of 1 is equal to 2 minus 3. f of 1 is equal to negative 1. Right, so if we wrote this as a point, just to wrap our head around it, the point would be 1 comma negative 1, right? x is the input, so x is 1, y would be negative 1. The output is negative 1. That's what we've written here with function notation. So it's just another way to represent the same piece of information. f of negative 6, so they're telling us that x equals negative 6. So we're going to substitute in negative 6 for x in our function. So we have 2 times negative 6 minus 3. So f of negative 6 is equal to negative 12 minus 3. f of negative 6 equals negative 15. f of negative 1 fourth. So they're telling us that x equals negative 1 over 4. So substituting negative 1 fourth in for x in the function, we have 2 times, let's stick with this color theme, so we have 2 times negative 1 fourth, we substitute it in for x, minus 3, so f of negative 1 over 4 is equal to, so this is 2 over 1, so if we reduce before we multiply, 2 and 4 simplify to give us 1 and 2. So multiplying across, we have negative 1 over 2 minus 3. We need to find a common denominator here. So 
3 over 1, multiply by 2, multiply by 2. So f of negative 1 fourth is equal to negative 1 half minus 6 over 2. So f of negative 1 fourth equals negative 7 over 2. Right? Input is negative 1 fourth. Our output is negative 7 over 2. If we wanted to write it as a point, it would be the point. Negative 1 fourth comma negative 7 over 2. Again, repetition here. If f of x equals negative 3x plus 4, for what values of x does f of x equal negative 2? So here, they're not giving us the input, they're giving us the output. Right? Negative 2 is the output. So essentially, what is x? What is the input? So, how do we figure that out? Well, if we had the input, we would substitute that in for x, but now we have the output, so we're going to substitute that in for f of x. So what we're going to get is we're going to get negative 2 equals negative 3x plus 4. And we have to work our way backwards to solve for x, to solve for our input. So we can do that by subtracting 4 on both sides. We would have negative 6 equals negative 3x. Divide both sides by negative 3. And we get 2 equals x. And to check ourselves, we can evaluate. Is f of 2, so that's negative 3. We're going to substitute in 2 for x. So 2 plus 4. Four. Let's fix that. It looks too choppy. So we have times 2 plus 4. So f of 2 is negative 6 plus 4. f of 2 is negative 2. So it checks out. Okay, so this is just reversing the information we've been given. In this example, they gave us the output. We have to find the input. Our next example, using f of x equals x squared minus 1, evaluate the following. f of 0. So they're telling us that x equals 0. So we're going to substitute 0 in for x. So 0. And then we have squared minus 1. So f of 0 is equal to 0 squared, which is 0, minus 1 f of 0 equals negative 1. In our next example, they're going to tell us that x equals 4, right? f of 4. x equals 4. That's our input. So we have equals, so we're going to have 4 substituted in for x squared minus 1. So f of 4 is equal to 4 squared, which is 16, minus 1. f of 4 is equal to 15. So we input 4, output 15. Again, just to connect it back, if we want to write this as a point, it would be the point 4, 15. 4 is our input, 15 is our output. f of negative 10. So they're telling us that x equals negative 10. That's our input. So that's equal to negative 10 substituted in for x squared minus 1. This is also a good reminder. When we're inputting our x value, put it in parentheses. In case it's negative, we don't mess up our signs. So we have f of negative 10. Negative 10 quantity squared is positive 100 minus 1. So f of negative 10 equals 99. Input negative 10, output 99. f of 2 thirds, so x equals 2 thirds. So f of 2 thirds equals, we're going to substitute in 2 thirds for x, and then squared minus 1. So f of 2 thirds is equal to, so 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, so 4 over 9 minus 1. 
So we need a common denominator. So I'll make that one over one. Multiply both the numerator and denominator by nine. So f of two thirds equals four ninths minus nine over nine. So f of two thirds equals negative five over nine. Input two thirds, output negative five over nine. If f of x equals x squared minus one, so our same function, for what values of x does f of x equal 24? So again, they're now telling us the output. So what is the input? What do we have to input to output 24? So again, we're going to substitute in 24 for f of x for our output. So 24 equals x squared minus one. So we can add one to both sides. So 25 equals x squared. So we can take the square root of both sides. And if we do that, we need to put a plus or minus because we can square a positive or a negative number and still get a positive output. So we're going to have plus or minus five equals x. So x equals five or x equals negative five. Now we're going to talk more in depth about quadratic equations, but this is a simple one that I think we can reason out what the inputs would be. And again, we can check ourselves. We can input five into our function. We can also input negative five into our function and check that we output 24. All right, so again, f of x represents the output, x is the input. Evaluate each of the following based off the given table, x and g of x. We have our table of values. So g of zero. So if we input, right, x equals zero. So if x equals zero, what's the output? On a table, when x equals zero, g of x equals zero. g of three, inputting three into our function. So if we input three, our output is 24. G of negative two, our input is negative two, x equals negative two. So we go to our table, we find x equals negative two, our output is negative six. So again, you wanna think of this, G of negative two, it's the output of our function when our input is negative two. That's what this notation is trying to tell us. And write that out if it helps. Right, what is the output when the input is negative two? For what value of x does g of x equal 60? So again, they're giving us the output and asking us what the input is. So now instead of going across the x row, we're going across the g of x row. And we're finding where it's equal to 60 and go backwards, what was the input? The input was four. So x equals four. When x equals four, our output is 60. Evaluate each of the following based off the graph. So here we have the graph of h of x. So first, h of negative three. So our x value, is negative three, what's the output? So we'll go to negative three on the x-axis, go up to our graph, there's our point. So the point is negative three comma two. So if we input negative three, our output is two. H of zero. So they're telling us input zero, x equals zero, what is the output? So when x equals zero, we go up to our graph, there's the point. So when we input zero, our output is four. H of five. So they're telling us to input five, x equals five. So when x equals five, we go down to the graph, there's the point, five negative two. So if we input five, h of five equals negative two. And again, the nice part about a graph is we're creating that relationship with our understanding of the point x comma y and how y is related to h of x, 
right? They're interchangeable. H of x and y are interchangeable. For what values of x does h of x equal 1? So what I'm going to do here is draw a horizontal line at 1 and look where the output or what inputs give us those outputs. So it intersects there and it intersects there. So if we want the output to be 1, right, we want y to be equal to 1. They're interchangeable, right? So we're thinking about y equals 1. What are the inputs that output 1? Well, we can see negative 4 is one of them. x equals negative 4. Or over here, x equals positive 4. For what values of x does h of x equal 4? So again, we want to find out what inputs, what x values, give us y equals 4, or output of 4. So if we do the same thing, I'll take a horizontal line at 4, and I made it a little above so we can still see the red underneath. So where is that? Well, that's from, I'll use purple now, that's from this point all the way to that point. Now, we can't possibly list all those x values out. There are infinitely many x values from x equals negative 1 to x equals 3. So we can write it in two ways. We could write it as an inequality to represent all those x values, or we could write it in interval notation. So let's do both. So for what x values? So we'll first represent it as an inequality. So from negative 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to, let's check the graph again. So from negative 1 all the way to 3, any x value in between or equal to negative 1 or 3 outputs 4. In interval notation, that would be bracket negative 1, comma 3, bracket. Now, this doesn't happen that often. They typically ask us a question like the one above. But to extend our understanding and tie in inequalities, which we've done, they could definitely push the bounds a little bit. If f of x equals 2 times the square root of x minus 4, evaluate f of 13. So again, our input is 13. x equals 13. What is our output? So f of 13, we're going to substitute 13 for x in the function. So 2 times the square root of 13 minus 4. So we have f of 13 equals 2 times the square root of 9, which is 2 times 3, which is 6. So f of 13 equals 6. If g of x equals 3x divided by x squared minus 4, evaluate g of negative 1. So again, our input's negative 1. That's our x value. So we're going to substitute in negative 1 for all of our x values. So 3 times negative 1 in parentheses, and then negative 1 in parentheses squared minus 4. So we have g of negative 1 equals negative 3 in the numerator over negative 1 squared, which is positive 1, minus 4. So that's negative 3 divided by 1 minus 4, which is also negative 3, which negative 3 divided by negative 3 is positive 1. So g of negative 1 equals 1. If we input negative 1, we output positive 1 in this particular function. And notice, I didn't point this out in the last few examples, it doesn't always have to be f of x. That's pretty common, f standing for function, but it could be g of x, it could be h of x, it could be any letter in place of that f for function. If f of x equals kx plus 7 and f of 4 equals negative 5, find the value of k. So let's start with this. If f of 4 equals negative 5, if I wrote this as a point, the x value would be 4, the y value would be negative 5. All right, remember, there's um, interchangeability between y and f of x. 
So the point for negative five is on this function. We need to figure out what that missing k value is. Well, f of x is like y, so we can substitute negative five, or let's let's step back a second. So f of four equals negative five, right? So we know x equals four. So let's substitute that into our function. So f of four equals k times four plus seven. So f of four equals four k plus seven. Now, what do we know f of four is? Well, f of four is equal to negative five. So we can substitute in negative five in place of our function, and that equals four k plus seven. So we can subtract seven from both sides. So negative 12 equals four k. Divide both sides by four, negative three equals k. Now, if you had trouble understanding what I did here, think of it this way. And we'll use the fact that we can write f of four equals negative five as the point for negative five. As I said earlier, y and f of x are interchangeable. So I could rewrite this function as y equals kx plus seven. And when I write it out this way, maybe it's a little bit more clear why we're able to substitute negative five on the left side of the equation and then four for x. And we'd solve the same way we did in blue over here. Okay, so function notation is new. It's different. Okay, a couple things. Make sure we're pronouncing it correctly. F of x, g of x. Understand that now y and f of x, or g of x, are interchangeable. Okay, we're looking for that input-output relationship which we're more familiar with as the x comma y relationship. And then when evaluating a function, whatever that input is, f of four, that's telling you x equals four. So we're going to substitute four in for each x in the function, and then we evaluate. Make sure your negative signs, your addition, all of that is correct. So the only way to get better at this is to do more examples and practice.